How are you doing this morning, Walter? Are we ready to save the planet? <laughs> we'll do it today. Great to be on. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's a, a lovely, warm, almost summer day over here on the East Coast. So uh, uh, all sorts of uh, birds passing through right now on migration. Uh, uh, couldn't be a better day to think about and talk about nature. So speaking of nature, why don't we start by talking about you and how you found your way to the E.O. Wilson Foundation and your role there. Well, thank you. It's uh, yeah, a real delight to be on uh, and to be talking to you today. I uh, started out as a, as a, as a naturalist, um, was a teenager, um, interested in, in initially plants and then more and more birds over time. And uh, um, uh, through running around the, the Southern German countryside and the Alps and then more and more expanding my my places of exploration uh, um, to Africa and other parts of the world, uh, I just got really for single individuals that I, I'd be observing, uh, but how it all fits together at the large scale. Um, so I became over time, initially I was this naturalist and I still am a, a passionate naturalist, but uh, as I I uh, would travel more and more and uh, try to understand what is it, what are the patterns uh, of biodiversity distributions, what are the places uh, with the most uh, diverse communities uh, of species. Um, I found myself more and more uh, also becoming a, what's called a biogeographer. I was interested in the geography of biodiversity, the global geography ultimately of, of life and uh, it's uh, 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 this together, thanks to, to the naturalist part, uh, uh, passion about single species and the many important uh, roles they have that you would observe, um, uh, and thereby the passion for conservation um, that then brought me to, to the research agenda uh, here at Yale University, the, the, the work that we're doing in the Center for Biodiversity and Global Change, but in particular, uh, it also brought me to the uh, E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, having uh, read early on many of, of Ed's works, getting inspired by them and finding myself a little bit, uh, just a tiny bit, uh, in the sorts of uh, situations that Ed did obviously a long time ago in a much more pioneering way, uh, but feeling an incredible connection to some of the things he said. Uh, uh, I uh, uh, I was just really thrilled uh, to uh, then uh, stumble uh, across the, the foundation and, and learning more and more about the work there and, and becoming part of it myself. Rachel, you're muted. I always do that to myself and I forget it doesn't automatically unmute me. Um, well, it's great to have you here and I'm sure it's great that they feel the same to have you working with the foundation. And let's jump right into some of the questions that were submitted. Um, so science is at the core of all of Dr. Wilson's work um, and many of his books, including Half Earth. Uh, so he has determined that if we manage half the Earth for species, that we can protect the bulk of biodiversity. Um, and as he says, we will enter the safe zone. But it's not just any half, correct? Um, so can you explain how you determined half and why that half is important? Thank you, and I'd be happy to. So this is where actually that, that field of biogeography comes in that I was just talking about and that, that Ed ultimately covers uh, also in his book, Half Earth. It's very much a, a, a biogeography applied to the 21st century book, I would argue, and perhaps one of the most important works uh, in, in, in that regard for, for a long time because it's uh, taking principles uh, out of actually uh, Ed's own pioneering work uh, long, uh, some, some time ago now, uh, biogeographic principles and, and applies them to uh, how we humans could be, should be thinking about our planet and the sustainable use of our planet today. Um, so, so at the heart of what Ed is actually talking about in Half Earth, it's, it's initially actually not the places, but it's uh, at the heart is actually uh, our species. So it's the biodiversity. Uh, species biodiversity is obviously more than just species. Uh, it's the 
uh, the, the, the functions, the traits that species have, um, it's the genetic diversity, it's the, the diversity of life forms, if you will, all together. But uh, uh, species are uh, a really, really uh, powerful handle and, and, and unit to uh, uh, ultimately approach the larger issue of, of biodiversity and biodiversity uh, conservation. And uh, um, the, the science that, that comes into the picture here uh, is how you connect what's ultimately at, at the core of the ambition of Half Earth, that is safeguard as many species as possible for future generations. How you go from that aspiration to then uh, a place-based agenda or a place-based action. So I can talk a little more about it in, in a bit, but uh, let's say we, are, we agree that species are vital elements uh, for our planet. Uh, we want to minimize losing species as we use more and more uh, of our planet. Um, as we think about how to best manage our planet, we want to minimize the number of species going extinct. So if we can agree on that, um, then the question really is, okay, what does that mean then? Uh, what uh, should we be doing? What should we not be doing? And most of all, where? Um, so that's what then uh, Half Earth, its book, um, and then the, the, the initiative that was born out of it, the Half Earth project and the Half Earth map, uh, aim to address. It's uh, by, from biogeography, uh, we know from back to Darwin and Wallace or Humboldt, uh, some of the early explorers who took voyages around the world uh, to come back with, with amazing life forms and highlighting how well where they came from back in England or Europe, uh, uh, things are a little less diverse and perhaps a little duller on the biodiversity front compared to some of the amazing biodiversity in the tropics. They were the first ones to highlight that um, biodiversity is distributed very unevenly in the world. And in fact, as you think about Galapagos, you have a key example, but uh, another one would be the Madagascar uh, or other such uh, places. There are some parts of the world that hold either many more species than other parts or their whole species that you just don't find anywhere else. And that's where the science of Half Earth comes in, to try and map out, to document uh, where uh, those places are, not just do it in a one-off way, but actually develop a global map that obviously you don't do in a single afternoon or you don't even do in a single year. Uh, it's something that we've started now uh, and we, we are gonna have a really, really strong go at an initial push uh, as part of the, the half F project and half F a project map over the next years. Um, but it's this sort of map that you fill in more and more over time and make better and better um, at the global scale uh, that would ultimately provide this space-based uh, aspect. So the spatial uh, context where it is that some of these rarest species occur and thereby where it is that some of the top uh, priority places in the world are for biodiversity conservation. And it's not just a random part, uh, it's a very specific part, as you say. And uh, uh, um, uh, in terms of the amount, we can talk a little more about that later. Uh, Ed applied sort of initial biogeographic principles to sort of land at this 50% figure. Um, and that's where that comes from. Um, but it's not a random 50%. It's a very specific 50% where we are trying to provide uh, the science and many other scientists around the world are, are advancing this knowledge base uh, for identifying uh, the, that half or, or that top priority part of the world that if we care about saving species from extinction, we need to be particularly mindful about where we need to think about setting up conservation management activities, reserves, engage local indigenous communities uh, in uh, uh, that larger aspiration of, hey, uh, let's really try uh, our everything. Uh, let's humani help humanity to try and uh, uh, just limit 
uh, the number of species we drive to extinction and that would be lost to future generations for forever. Yeah, so let's not have that happen. So I'm really glad that there are people that are out there and working and making sure that this planet thrives long after our generation and for the generations to come. So you talk about species and their central role. Um, can you expand a little on that? Um, how are they at the core of half Earth and why is ensuring their survival uh, for future generations so critical? So uh, we all know about our favorite charismatic species, right? Whether it be the panda bear or uh, some of the really amazing birds or mammals or others you have up here in, in the United States or uh, in North America. Um, and uh, uh, species are, are something that it's, it's really hard to attach a value to, right? We can begin to do that. Uh, and, and economists have tried it a little bit. It's hard uh, ultimately to, to, uh, to do that. So what is it that you would lose that you feel your children would lose if they, they never saw, uh, were never able to see uh, 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 a, a recent panda video or, or a panda encounter in a zoo, or they wouldn't ever be able to see a bear or even uh, a condor. Uh, or, or even some other species uh, close to home. And that, very, that, that value to each one of us may be very, very small indeed, but once you, you aggregate it across all people alive and, and just aggregate it over future generations, it's actually quite, quite substantial. Um, so that's kind of one argument that's been made around sort of the aesthetic uh, value, the, the sort of quality of life, the benefit that we're getting. Uh, and I think you as your uh, uh, avid book readers and, 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 and intellectuals, uh, I think uh, I don't need to say much more about just the, the immense value that uh, is in these, in an existing uh, uh, species. Like you think of a, of, of a work of art, like what is it, what would it do us if we were to lose a particular painting of Picasso, what would we lose, right? It's hard to quantify, um, but, uh, uh, it is an intrinsic value that I think we can all uh, we can all connect with, and uh, um, but that's just the one one way to look at it. Uh, species also uh, carry uh, incredible functions and uses, not just uh, as as elements of the ecosystem, but even all the way over to humans in terms of the pest control, in terms of um, potentially holding uh, medicinal value, uh, uh, and uh, it's a whole a range of discoveries that's still ongoing, uh, um, cures, treatments that we derive from species on an ongoing basis um, that we need to be thinking about as we, as we talk about species and not uh, uh, preventing future generations, our children, their children, uh, future generations from having those assets still around would be depriving uh, the planet. Um, and uh, uh, every species is a is a node in a larger web of interactions in every place, and even though you may not have understood that net sufficiently yet to know what's going to happen if you take out a species, um, there is no no question that something will change as you lose a species out of that web, or as you lose a species uh, ability to perhaps re-enter that web web as it sort of may have been lost somewhere else. Um, so these would be local extinctions, and there are a lot of local extinctions going on as we change the planet. Uh, but uh, the very worst that could happen, and that's at the heart of what Ed is talking about in his book, Half Earth, is if you were to lose a species for forever. It's troubling if and as we lose uh, populations, uh, many of you may have seen the press coverage of, of, of North American songbirds uh, and, and, and actually birds, birds generally uh, losing populations uh, in a really, really dramatic way. And that is very, very uh, troubling indeed, because this is really affecting uh, the functions, the health of our ecosystems and our livelihoods. Um, but nothing is as bad as losing that node. And that may be a slightly different node and, and uh, um, role that a species plays in different parts of the world to lose that and lose it for forever and lose the potential for it to to come back uh, to reintroduce it or to to somehow uh, uh, support uh, future ecosystems future communities 
So uh, 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 safeguarding species, making sure that you keep some po populations around for future generations in their natural habitats. Uh, I personally think, at least for my career and my, my science, and, and what we're trying to support, there's nothing more important that I, I, I could be dedicating our work to. Uh, and uh, um, that's where uh, uh, science scientists have a really important role to play in, in, in providing the, the R&D, if you will, the information, uh, the scientifically driven information that can help uh, local campaigns, uh, regional local stakeholders, uh, uh, enter, entering in discussions around a certain development or a certain conservation action, politicians. Um, that's the sort of information that, that we need to, to provide to them, that we're obligated to provide to them, so that um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to lose species. And that's just a fact, and, 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 and uh, uh, it's a very sad fact. Uh, but uh, I think the very worst that, that society, humanity could do is if we were to lose species unknowingly. So if we, we didn't even know, or we didn't even care to know uh, what we would drive to extinction in a particular place. And uh, that's what we try to, to address through the science uh, that's been inspired by, by Ed's uh, book, Half Earth. Offer up, develop the maps and the information so that everybody knows if you're not doing something over here, or if you're doing something bad over here, uh, you'd, you'd be uh, driving this or that species to extinction and, and, and lose it for everybody else in the future. Yes, and uh, a planet with just us does not sound very interesting or exciting. So I think keeping as many species around is a, is a good thing. So when I think of it from just a person and my niece and the joy that I get just from nature and from animals and even my own dog. I know it's not a species in the wild, but I would gather that all species are at risk if we don't change our behaviors and take care of the planet and all these different things that we love. So it's great work that um, Ed started and that you guys are continuing. So as you, uh, by the way, if you're just joining us, we have a few questions that were submitted in advance and then we'll be able to open up some Q&As to everyone joining us in the Zoom meeting. So you'll get to ask some questions uh, for Walter at the end. So if you wanna jot those down or just hold them in your thoughts, um, we're gonna just dive into a couple questions and then turn it over to you guys for a live Q&A. So we'd love for you to explain how you're identifying which half. Um, Ed says we live on a little known planet. Uh, so the species data, where is it coming from? And how are you gathering that data? How are you analyzing that data? Um, processing that data? And what is the difference in the approach that you guys are taking at Half Earth from maybe other approaches that have been taken in the past? Thank you. Yeah, so the what 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 we are doing what what spatial conservation prioritization that's kind of the that that larger uh, field uh, that we're talking about here is, is is generally doing is it relies on 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 data collected in the field some of the very sort of data that that Ed uh, has been and still does uh, collect uh, uh, for for ants and for in his this case and, and and other species groups. Um, and many other naturalists out there that he has inspired uh, or that are just going about their work and have been going about their work for the last century. So a lot of uh, data is actually sitting in museums. It's attached to museum specimen uh, and the coordinates that are sitting with them. So don't think about these specimens just as dead, dead pieces in a museum. They are actually convey important information about where they came from and uh, provide a record. And uh, Nowadays, there's a lot of citizen science activities. Some of you may be uh, citizen scientists yourself and checking in uh, species that you see in a, through some app and, and contributing them. Uh, and then there are experts that, that ultimately synthesize that information and uh, draw maps that you may be familiar with from field guides. If you ever sort of had a field guide in your hands for birds or, or plants, whatever it may be, there's this little map. And uh, I was just yeah talking more about how we do this and how we develop uh, the evidence base, if you will, and uh, and this draws on uh, efforts, contributions of thousands and tens of thousands of 
scientists and citizen scientists over the last centuries, uh, and particularly in recent days, uh, people that are compiling uh, observations. We are, if you will, the synthesizers. We and others out there, biogeographers, conservation biogeographers, we, we try to bring that together, information together. And, and we in particular at uh, the Half Earth uh, project um, in, in uh, liaison with a project uh, called Map of Life that's hosted here at, Map of, at, at Yale University, we are uh, developing uh, models um, that then pull in also remote sensing information from satellites, uh, a whole suite of, of uh, artificial intelligence or statistical uh, methods to then come up with the best possible characterization of where each single species uh, occurs on the planet. And that's obviously an imperfect uh, science still um, and uh, uh, a key effort of ours and of many other scientists in the field of biogeography is to, 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 to do better and map uh, through these uh, quantitative approaches, uh, linking in remote sensing and other things, uh, more and more of biodiversity and greater and greater detail. So that's, if you will, at the, at the heart or at the base of the half-Earth uh, uh, map science. Um, because without this information, you don't know, right? What may be occurring in a particular place and what you may be losing. Now with this information for tens of thousands of species, you can do something called uh, an, a spatial reserve design or you can apply optimization uh, techniques that use the principle of complementarity uh, to identify the places that are most important or species uh, going forward. So if you were to lose that place or change something in this particular place, um, uh, a place where that, uh, where any such impact would have uh, a greatest repercussions overall. So uh, uh, the hotspots, if you will, of, of conservation priority, uh, that's what we are uh, identifying through uh, these first single species models and then uh, um, through uh, 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 approaches that build on top of that and drive prioritization algorithm. With this, and if you allow me to, I can quickly show you the yeah. uh, a map, the global map that actually shows some of the results. If you if you will, cool. Yeah, I was so, going to say this sounds like a great time to show the map. Yeah. So if we jump over here, I get to share my screen. Uh, one moment. Uh, are you able to see my screen, Rachel? It says you. Yes, you're all set. Cool. Uh, so I hope the bandwidth uh, is supporting this. So what we're looking at here is the current version of the Half Earth map. And you can find this at half-earthproject.org uh, slash maps. And uh, here is kind of a simplified version, if you will, of the top places for conservation activity going forward for, in this case, uh, terrestrial vertebrates, so that's birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. So tens of thousands of species supported the identification of these places. And uh, I was mentioning Madagascar earlier, and uh, it's really one of the, the most uh, marvelous places in the world uh, that holds an incredibly large number of unique species that are not found anywhere else. You may all be familiar with the, um, the lemurs, but there are many other species groups uh, um, that uh, chameleons, for example, certain reptiles that you only find uh, in this region that makes that part of the world a real high priority uh, place for conservation. Or we can go to the Atlantic forest down here uh, and we can go in and explore this area uh, a bit further and uh, learn about uh, uh, what species uh, are particularly important in this place. So you see uh, through this visualization how uh, certain uh, birds, for example, would be limited to just that region. This brassy breasted tanager, for example, has a, a really small global range it, and uh, uh, pretty much all of it is restricted to the smaller and smaller parts of the Atlantic forest that have not been yet encroached for agriculture or, or urbanization. And these are species that don't occur anywhere else in the world. So if you're uh, in this location uh, losing habitats, uh, you're about to lose those species. Um, so in the half earth map, you can see how much of that landscape may already be protected. You see this in the, in the uh, 
and the darker green areas and then which places are already encroached. Oh, Sao Paulo, one of the big metropolises, uh, one of the biggest metropolis there is in the world uh, is together with Rio de Janeiro more and more uh, encroaching on these mountains, on these forests. Uh, and thanks to satellite based uh, monitoring of the earth surface that we are uh, bringing to you here in this browser, we were able to, to see these impacts in greater and greater detail. And uh, in the half earth map uh, research, we are, are linking these high resolution pieces up with one another to then identify the places uh, that are most important for future conservation activities. And we can do that uh, not just for a single place or these uh, hotspots that I was pointing out, but we can look at uh, the full global map and identify here in yellow on a, in a continuous color scale from highest to lowest, highest yellow, lowest blue, uh, the uh, top priority places in the world for future conservation activities. So here, pretty much all of Madagascar, bright yellow. Uh, many of these uh, corners of Africa that hold tropical forest, super high priority. Uh, here we were talking about the Atlantic forest in Brazil. Um, also much of Mexico and then over in Baja and, and actually many parts of California and here for amphibians in particular, Southeastern United States holds actually global uh, significance because the species there, a lot of the frogs there uh, and some of the reptiles only occur there. So the, the US is in the game here very much. Um, and this is, you're looking at kind of a biogeography, right? The reason why much of the north here is, is rather blue is because of colder temperatures, past glaciation, um, leading to relatively few species occurring there. Uh, and certainly then the species that occur there often not being geographically very rare. So many species you find in Connecticut, you would also find over much of, uh, of Canada. So feel free to uh, explore this map and uh, look at some of these fascinating overlays in there with existing uh, protected areas or indeed with uh, existing uh, uh, human pressures. Uh, and there are some parts that we are offering up in, in great detail. For example, here in, in South Africa, uh, you can look at uh, some of the, the very detailed modeling uh, that we're, we're undertaking um, and uh, 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 look at those patterns in, in great detail. So perhaps I should lead back to you. And, and if there's another question, I can, I can come back to this uh, and we can drill into some of these places. Back to you, Rachel. Back to me. Um, that's really exciting to watch you click around the map. I've played with it online a little bit, and it's just so interesting to see it in real time and then be able to see the species that we're looking at that are in those geographic locations and then relate them to where they're at and how they could disappear and even just watching you talk about the controlled area that that specific bird species were in. I think when you can really show people that visually, that's a fantastic tool to help people understand the work that you're doing. So very, very cool. Um, you can all visit the map. It's on the halfearth.org website. And you can fly around like very similar to Google Earth and find different places that you're interested in and see some of the work that's going on for conservation in those. Uh, so back to talking about your research, have you discovered anything unexpected? So it's, it's a really uh, fascinating exercise to, to go from species to then places, right? And uh, as we do this um, and we, 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 we work away species by species. We try that we get the best possible range map and prediction on a species by species basis. Um, you, you, you're sort of uh, doing this species by species. You're actually uh, 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 stuck in the weeds, if you will. Um, and there is, there's no moment as, as exciting in this, in this field as uh, the moment when you're finally put, finished everything, finished all birds and all mammals say in, in, with the mapping and you're, you're putting them all on top of one another and you're running your first analysis to identify, okay, across all of these 20,000 maps say, what is it then, uh, what is the number one place uh, in terms of uh, species, varied spatial 
rarity or in terms of the priority for conservation because you can't initially uh, know that um, from from just these individual maps so it's always like this amazing aha moment and wow when we for the first time look at the map of the sort that i just showed you uh, because you're always uncovering patterns that you didn't appreciate before or some mountain uh, region suddenly pops out or some island pops out that just wasn't appreciated uh, before may have been appreciated by a particular expert in that region but here we're talking about the global picture right so only if you look at it globally are you able to appreciate the global significance of a place so obviously the atlantic forest the places that i was talking about earlier madagascar it's been long appreciated those are those whole unique species but uh what's really cool about this this whole global approach conducted in a standardized uh, way uh, through the science we do is that uh, we, we're really able to, to do the full global quantification and we're able to uh, not just to other scientists or the broader public but to anybody at any location in the world are able to tell them about hey that that mountain behind your house um, it has this level of global significance you need to do the whole global analysis first to really put it every place in a global context and that's what i think is is most exciting right now that we're able to do that and uh, that's uh, that led to all sorts of discoveries at my end that's what keeps driving me uh, on on just from a purely scientific geeky reason keeping on doing this but uh, um it's also what uh, uh, if you will differentiates uh the half earth uh science the half earth map from other conservation approaches that are, uh, and there's a nice complementarity uh, around those different approaches out there. There's a lot of important work going on by some of the large conservation NGOs that are driving forward certain campaigns in certain places um, for very good reason and with very good justification. Um, what we try to provide in a complementary way uh, and supporting all of these efforts is this quantitative global picture and that can then be picked up and used by anybody in local and regional discussions uh, and we want to be the half of science inspired by what ed's been saying in his book half Earth, right put species on the map identify the most important places for biodiversity conservation it will likely be around half um, by doing that we are able to 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 help others uh, make better decisions for uh, biodiversity going forward. So, and one of the questions that uh, we wanted to ask you was, what is your favorite part of the book and why? So I have to say as, as a geek here, uh, it's, it's as the biogeographer, uh, it's, it's, it's those parts where Ed uh, 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 builds his arguments on uh, his class classic insights uh, in, on, on island biogeography. Now those have been uh, uh, modified since uh, we uh, have learned a lot since uh, uh, thanks to, to all the other work that's been inspired by, by uh, his, his and uh, uh, John McArthur's, uh, excuse me, Robert McArthur's uh, uh, island biogeography theory. So uh, McArthur and Wilson theory of island biogeography. Um, it's uh, 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 that part how the number of species decreases with the size of the islands uh, and that initial rule that that sort of came about there that was one of the first uh major insights uh, uh in in the, that sort of quantitative uh, insights in in, in biogeography actually full, full stop that 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 relationship uh and that is that relationship that he ultimately uses to say well uh if we use this line roughly, um, we, we shouldn't, it, it tells us that if we get to 50% less area, you've already lost about 10, 15% of species. I would say that's the most we should possibly lose. And now, as I said, th this, this rule has been very much changed and modified since, and we're now able to do this as I've just been explaining on a species by species basis. And that's really how ultimately we, we want to address the issue. Um, but as we do that, actually, it's intriguing. We do find ourselves landing still in roughly the sort of numbers that Ed 
uh, uh, and Robert McArthur uh, at the time uh, identified uh, in, 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 their, in their initial pioneering work. So it's that part in the book that I, I feel is, isn't uh, actually driving our, our research right now anymore. So this has been um, superseded by, by more quantitative single species models of the sort I was talking about earlier. But all of what we're doing now is inspired by these early insights. And uh, it's, it's, Ed, it's, it's Ed's uh, amazing ability to identify these rules or patterns and then pulling out the numbers that are easy to communicate and, and people to, to connect with and, and, and understand and build on that uh, uh, is so, so special. Uh, and that's, that brings us to our conversation today, uh, thanks to his book, Have Earth, which was really just a horizontal line, uh, sorry, a vertical line uh, at a certain point in this line that he discovered and where he said, well, that should be the stopping point because here we would have lost too much. So it's that part that that's my favorite. And we're all developing our favorites as we read together. So thank you. Um, now we're going to turn it over to you guys. Uh, if you have some questions that you'd like to ask, um, you can put them in the chat and I can narrate them for you. Or if you'd like to turn on your video and raise your hand, I will unmute you. And then we'll just go around and give everyone a chance to ask their questions. So at this time, I would like to open it up to questions from the club. Like I said, just waiting here in the chat for, um, if you let me know in the chat that you'd like to ask a question, I will go ahead and unmute you. So this way you can while we wait, uh, Rachel, I can quickly show again here this more detailed section uh, that I was talking about earlier uh, in uh, Southern Africa. If you're able to see the screen here. Yes, we are. Uh, so we were able, thanks to remote sensing and these, these models that I mentioned earlier, to uh, uh, begin to map priority areas an amazingly fine spatial resolution. Um, and uh, it's through this sort of detail that we can bring together active conservation efforts in the region uh, with ongoing uh, pressures on the landscape and identify uh, priority areas for conservation. For example, here, single mountain ridges that even hold species on a single mountain ridge not found anywhere else um, and were for example, private reserves uh, are offering up uh, immense uh, conservation uh, uh, relevance uh, at a global scale. Just a single small private reserve can help sustain a species for future generation. And in this particular part of the world, uh, if you're able to, to uh, and, and you're able to justify that and show that if you're able to, to bring uh, the right spatial uh, biodiversity information uh, together here. So this just as a little example, back to you, Rachel. So I, um, I, if you uh, unview your screen sharing, I'll be able to see if anyone has raised their hand and has a question. Um, and if not, I, of course, have a question that's relative to the species that are not land-based, um, that are in the waters of the planet, in the oceans, and all of the things that are glowing, uh, going on with the acidity of the oceans changing, and water quality changing, and temperatures changing. Um, how do you guys factor in uh, the ocean environment to the work that you're doing? Or do you at all? We do. Um, and I, I encourage you to have a poke around the, the Half Earth Map website. Uh, and uh, there you can look at the same patterns that I just showed you for terrestrial vertebrates. Uh, you can look at the same patterns for marine vertebrates. And so we were able to identify the hotspots for uh, conservation, the, the, priority, the conservation priority hotspots uh, for uh, marine species. So far, uh, we've only been able to include fishes, marine fishes, uh, but we're in the process of expanding that uh, to other species groups. So thanks to the engagement uh, uh, of, of supporters of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, we're able to, to, to uh, 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 have the capacity now to address and add on 
species groups uh, for marine as well. Uh, and we're expanding on land as well to select invertebrate groups. And that's, uh, that's key, obviously, right? Because we are uh, still looking at a relatively limited number. I, I think it's exciting and it's, it's a, a vital insights that we're already able to get now, but it's very much in spirits, in the spirit of uh, its book and its other books on, on taxonomy, on uh, the importance of ants, for example, for our planet. Uh, to uh, to bring in other species groups and uh, marine, you can already explore fish right now online. But I see there are some questions coming through. There's yep, one online. Yep. Somebody else raised their hand. Yeah. Yep. So Catherine, one second, we'll get to you. We have the first question coming in from Cheryl that mentioned that uh, when we got a chance to talk to Paula, she was talking about how 15% of land and 7% of the ocean are protected. So her question was, how are you, is the project monitoring progress towards 50%? Yeah, uh, very much so. And actually, in fact, you can, you can look at that on the top right of the, the half Earth, uh, map website. There is actually a little uh, a clock, if you will, that shows our progress towards half. Uh, now there are, are UN organizations that are uh, uh, bringing in the governmental data on, on reserves, uh, new reserves that are getting added. Uh, now, thankfully, there's a whole additional push around less formal reserves, uh, sort of uh, uh, alternative conservation areas that may be addressing particular species. So uh, we are engaging with others that compile that reserve or co conservation area information to monitor uh, this progress. But where our particular contribution then comes in is that we are translating what these percentages mean for species. So having protected 15% of land doesn't mean that you have protected sufficiently 15% of land species. In fact, thankfully, it means We've already protected, actually, through our analysis, we're able to show that we've already uh, protected uh, more than uh, 30, 40 percent of species sufficiently. But there's still a large number of species that are, and, and I'm talking about uh, terrestrial vertebrates now, but there's still a large number of species that uh, we are not sufficiently protecting. And uh, as new reserve data is coming in, we are repeating our analysis on an ongoing basis, and that's the monitoring we are uh, pledging to do going forward. We're trying to, uh, to monitor uh, how many gap species remain, so how many species are still not sufficiently protected, what percent of species still are not sufficiently protected, and we, alongside, the map the places that need attention so that they don't fall through the cracks. Great, so Catherine, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. So Catherine, you are unmuted. Go ahead and what is your question? Thank you, I, I'm very interested in the link between species and the Earth's life support systems, and particularly in different areas, the keystone species. What, how do you pay attention to this keystone species? Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I brought it up earlier that it's obviously uh, the, the functions that, that species hold, right, for other species around them and, for, and sometimes for, for, for humans uh, that, that, uh, uh, that drives us in making species this unit that we are focusing on. So uh, um, there is a whole range of species that have already been identified to, yes, kind of represent an ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem health more generally, uh, or to be representative for, for other species, uh, or species that if you were to remove them, uh, you know uh, a community, an ecosystem, and its services would, would potentially collapse. But uh, the, the key point uh, I would make here is that there are so many things we just don't know yet. And that's a key point that, that Ed actually is been making for decades, right? There, the, the, our knowledge, and, and you, you actually uh, cited him there earlier, Rachel, in your interview, right? There is so much that's still unknown. And, and it's, it's actually uh, shameful, I would argue, right? If we think about Humboldt, it just had its 250th birthday uh, last year. Uh, uh, 
uh, one of the big early explorers, uh, if he was to come back again today, I think he would be appalled about the, our state of knowledge. Uh, there are places of the world where we still know about as much as he knew at the time about them, right? He, places that he explored and barely anybody has been back to since. Uh, and uh, so, so I would argue that while we do not know and may not ever be able to quantify the particular role that each species plays, um, we, 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 we better make sure we, we keep all of them or as many of them around as possible. Um, and I can add that there, there are ways in which we're trying to bring in func what's called functional diversity or functional uniqueness into the picture. Um, so there are some species where we just we can objectively quantify how they are doing something very unique in a particular location. An example I always use is the oil bird in South America. That's the only uh, nocturnal aerial frugivore in the region. You don't have fruit bats in South America. So this would be, it's a bird. It's a little bit like the, like the night hawk uh, in the US, but it eats fruits and disperses seeds over hundreds of kilometers in South America. So it plays a really important functional role. Um, yet we know incredibly little about that species. Um, so yes, species like that do stick out. We can quantify some species as having this particular role. And we are able to bring that into our conservation prioritization, but without knowing where the species are to begin with, uh, you couldn't even do that. So getting the biogeography sorted first uh, is at the heart of anything else you'd want to do. Thank you, Catherine. That's a great question. So we've got a couple questions coming from the Facebook stream. Uh, so this one says, Europe has relatively little in terms of areas to protect. How do you address the issue that most of the pressure to protect is in a narrow band of the planet? Yeah, no, it's 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 a really really important point. Uh, so so Europe has an immense amount of, of protection going on. Actually, many countries there have more than 30, 40 uh, percent of of their area under conservation. Um, so they have a lot of protected areas. Yet, uh, from a global perspective, there is very little unique. Uh, biodiversity there. Um, um, and uh, yeah, as we, we, when we look at the map finds, uh, there are some countries that are, um, if you will, unusually strongly uh, burdened by uh, conservation need, a global conservation need, if you will. So I mean, there are, those are countries that are incredibly rich. I would start with that. They're extremely wealthy in biodiversity. And many countries, many of them are actually recognizing these, these, these resources, these, these assets increasingly going forward. And that's also inter entering important discussions uh, around uh, ownership uh, and uh, downstream uses of some of the, the biodiversity, for example, for, for health uh, benefits for drugs, etc. cetera. Um, but that means some of these countries, say Madagascar, right? Um, uh, also have an immense conservation burden. And actually in some research, we, we quantified that. We, we related the amount of area that our predictions suggest. So the, all the yellow that you see in the map, how that relates to the um, per capita GDP of these countries. And, uh, and some countries are just way above the line there, have an unusually high burden. And then other countries, many European countries are below the line. They have a really large GDP per capita GDP yet and have very little conservation uh, needs. So there is a, a, a political discussion going on right now as part of the renegotiation of the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's one of the UN conventions. Uh, uh, and you may be familiar with the Climate Convention. Uh, the Paris Accord has come out of that, for example. Uh, there is a similar convention for biodiversity, less famous. Um, but right now we are trying to negotiate, if you will, a uh, we means humanity, uh, ultimately the ministries of environment and politicians uh, around the world uh, that are part of this treaty. Uh, the US is not, by the way, it's one of those cases, um, uh, is are negotiating uh, their Paris Accord, if you will, for biodiversity. And our research in some of the publications uh, that we are writing 
we're making the very strong argument that there needs to be a mechanism uh, that some sort of that offers up support to these countries, financial support to these countries that are particularly strongly burdened in the interest of, of our global, uh, of global society. But politically, pushing this through is obviously a, a difficult one. So we have time for one more question. We're closing on the top of the hour. Um, so the last question we're going to take, it says, what comment do you have on the UN report from May of 2019 that a million species are at the risk of extinctions in the coming decade? Um, so yeah, I'm familiar with that report. I was, I was one of the, the uh, co-authors of, of, of that report. I, I represented um, uh, um, the U.S. Uh, as uh, um, uh, uh, in, in the writing of this report, and it's a report that ultimately goes back to something called the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, uh, and again, that's a process similar to the IPCC that's underpinning the climate change discussion. So this is an important report. It's like the two degrees Celsius thing or 1.5 degrees Celsius recommendation that came out of the IPCC report. And uh, um, uh, the million species piece, excuse me, that came out of this is one that uh, is debatable. Um, and and I, uh, I actually had an interview on, on Science Friday where, where I was very much making that, that point uh, about this being a figure that's wildly extrapolated, it's just based on an initial assessment of how many species of European insects, actually particularly bees in Europe, are currently considered at risk of extinction. And then the, that number was taken, that proportion was taken and applied to the current global estimate of how many insects there are in the world to then arrive at this million number. So it's, it's scientifically, Bit of a problematic exercise. Uh, it's a wild extrapolation, I would say. Now, is it a wrong number? I don't think so. I, I believe that um, given that we're looking at, at uh, millions and millions of species on this planet, of which only a small portion is described right now, and say we're working with a 10 million species number, uh, uh, assuming that 10% are, are at risk of extinction is is no exaggeration because we do find that uh, uh, again and again where we look that 10, 20, 30 percent percent of species are uh, at risk of extinction. And it's particularly the tropics that remain understudied uh, where we need to do more mapping of the sort that I was talking about because that's where most species are. And as we do more and more of that, we'll be able to pinpoint which species in particular and actually bookend uh, narrow the uncertainty around that number uh, more and more. And that's very much part of what the Half-Earth Project is trying to support, map more and more species so you can understand the threats, you can understand the conservation needs so that we can not just throw out some numbers, which I think in this case are, are probably roughly right, but not scientifically very well supported. Uh, but more than that, uh, we are also able to identify the species that are at risk and identify the places where we need to get active in the spirit of what Ed wrote in his book, Half Earth. And what a fantastic way to close this meeting of the Mickey Hart Book Club. We are so grateful to the E.O. Wilson Biover Biodiversity Foundation for participating with us. We will be back in another two weeks with another special guest leading up to our final book club meeting on June 10th, um, where we'll have a lot of special guests and a fantastic panel discussion as we all continue to read this incredible book and be incredibly inspired uh, please visit the website so you can learn more about how you can participate, uh, not just by reading the book, but by actions you can take in your daily life and your local communities. And we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you again, Walter. It was great to have you here. And again, everyone who joined us today, um, I wish you a fantastic rest of your day. I like Thank to you. make a joke at the end of my Zooms. I say, namaste, namaste go. <laughs> so we will end with that, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you for joining. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.